Thank you, Chairman Neal, uh, Ranking Member Tiberi, uh, members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to appear before you today and very much appreciate the invitation. I'm particularly pleased to be talking about this issue um, of infrastructure. <clears throat> At the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, we firmly believe that infrastructure is one of the key building blocks to a low-carbon, innovation-fueled, and export-oriented economy that we need for the future. Yet we desperately need new ways of financing and decision-making when it comes to infrastructure in the United States. Today, we generally do not select projects on the basis of their merit. We're biased against maintenance, and we do very little long-term planning. In this context, we do feel that a merit-driven National Infrastructure Bank could be the vehicle for green-lighting those infrastructure projects from roads to rails uh, or ports and pipes that have the highest return on investment and support a 21st century economy. A development bank, in essence, an NIB, would have to balance the rate of return policies of a bank with the policy goals of a federal agency. The creation of such a special financing entity for infrastructure has been discussed in policy circles for at least about 20 years. Across the Atlantic, the European Investment Bank has been functioning successfully for about 50 years, playing a major role in connecting the European Union across national borders. The EIB, the European Bank, raises funds from capital markets and leases them, I'm sorry, lends them at higher rates, keeping its operations financially sustainable. It offers debt instruments such as loans and debt guarantees, as well as important technical assistance. As you heard this morning, an NIB for the U.S. can take many forms, but at its heart, it really is about the better selection of infrastructure projects. The NIB would lend or grant money on a project basis after some type of benefit cost analysis. In addition, the projects would be of national or regional significance, transcending state and local boundaries. And it would consider different types of infrastructure projects, breaking down the modal barriers that exist today. This would be a giant step from the federal funding for infrastructure that exists today, most of which is dispersed as federal aid transportation grants to states, mostly in a siloed manner. Yet despite the general agreement about the purpose and the need of a national infrastructure bank, some outstanding questions do remain. For one, it's unclear whether it would be limited to certain sectors, such as transportation, or if it would allow applications from a variety of infrastructure areas. Another is the governance structure, and here I think there are a myriad of options. It could be housed within a federal agency, as the administration has proposed in its recent budget. It could be established as a government-owned corporation, such as Amtrak, or has been proposed by uh, Congresswoman DeLauro, or as a shareholder-owned corporation, like government-sponsored enterprises such as Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which, as you know, have their own problems today. Of course, there's also a trade-off between the independence and the cost of borrowing. If an NIB is a federal agency, it may draw upon the Treasury's low interest rates to finance its activities. If it was a shareholder-owned entity, it would incur higher costs of borrowing than the Treasury, so the loans going to recipients would have to be at higher interest rates. Therefore, the budgetary and debt impact of the federal investment through a national infrastructure bank depends heavily on its governance structure, and I think that's where the conversation should be today. Unless the national infrastructure bank is a shareholder-owned corporation, its investments would be included in the federal budget. If it has the power to issue its own bonds and is not a shareholder-owned corporation, its debt would be on the federal books. In any other case, it would be treated like any other federal agency funded through appropriations and included in the federal budget. The federal government would have to pay for increased spending, which is likely to add to the federal debt. The mandate of a national infrastructure bank in practice would also overlap with the mandates of other existing programs. One is the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act program. TIFIA, as it's known, was created to help finance transportation projects of national or regional significance. The program is managed by the Federal Highway Administration and provides three forms of credit assistance, secured loans, loan guarantees, and standby lines of credit to a wide range of public and private entities. TIFIA is illustrative, is illustrative because it highlights the significant demand for this type of financing tool. There are, however, three important differences between TIFIA and the general concept of a national infrastructure bank. One, obviously, is that TIFIA is available only for transportation projects and other infrastructure sectors such as water are not eligible. The related point is that TIFI is run out of the Department of Transportation, not a standalone entity or housed in something like the Treasury Department, which others have proposed. Second, TIFI is not really a competitive program. The evaluation criteria is basically based on financial viability, not on project impacts, which many are proposing for the National Infrastructure Bank. Third is that an NIB is generally expected also to provide grants that are to uniquely eligible projects, whereas TIFI really is only a credit enhancement program or a credit program. Lastly, there have been some discussions about NIBs using uh, tax-preferred bonds as a financing tool for the infrastructure projects. 
Here, I think there are some um, relationships between the NIB and the Build America bonds. Started up in the stimulus package, obviously with the leadership of this committee, expectations of about four to five billion um, from the Build America bonds. Now we're seeing this borrowing tool exceeding about $97 billion. But while the BABs are very popular and tremendously successful, they're largely funding local improvements such as school uh, and sewer improvements, many of which I think would not meet the National Infrastructure Bank's criteria for regionally or nationally significant projects. So it's not an either or between these two tools. Mr. Chairman, we do believe that a more competitive United States economy needs a better infrastructure system, and in a time of limited resources, improving the federal investment process should be coupled with finding ways to increase the amount of funding for infrastructure. Yet, a National Infrastructure Bank is not a silver bullet for dealing with infrastructure reform, and in the end, we think the National Infrastructure Bank should really be thought of as a precision tool uh, and not a blunt instrument. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome all of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Quintus.